Good morning, 8A1 and 8B4. This is Miss Lawson. Um, hopefully everyone is feeling really well and um, you've been getting on with the work really well last week. I've had a couple of emails to say people aren't feeling particularly well and actually I don't feel very well um, today whatsoever. I have to record this video today um, but I'm feeling a little strange, a little shivering. My head's not particularly working um, particularly great. I feel a bit discombobulated so if, I'm just going to say uh, very sorry in advance for what may well be a little bit of a rambly lesson um, but it's a nice lesson um, you know we are obviously looking at our theory and legend and I'm going to recap of what we've done over the last few weeks um, but it's slightly different because we're looking at a poem now the poem isn't written obviously by Michael Mopergo so it's the book that we are reading however the poet has taken and manipulated parts of the legend and put it and embedded it into their poem so there's one or two characters that are similar there's the place that's similar so the poet is completely different we've never really come across him before you will come across him in further years to come actually through, through other poems but today we're going to look at something different so let's just have a do now task before we get cracking um here we have and you know i do love a, a good um image to kind of pick apart and have a look and just get your brains whirring get your brain started and down the side here on the left, um, there are some sentence starters. I would like you to fill in the missing blanks on your own interpretation. Remember, you are the reader, the audience. Yeah, your opinion matters, it counts. Um, and so it's just a way of how you're just going to investigate the picture, really, for essentially. Uh, Have a look, <clears throat> see what you can see. Take note of people's faces, for instance, and see if you can find any kind of hidden clues as to what the artist was trying to achieve. And this artist, um, sorry, this painting does relate to the play. Okay, so what did we do last week? Well, um, we all had to um, write uh, a comparative paragraph. Um, and on the whole, I was kind of really, really impressed with what I'd received. You had to look at these two different extracts. There was um, the fight scene and then there was the Lady of the Lake scene. Um, I will go over those again perhaps next week and I've got a few more entries in via either email or Teams. Um, in terms of Lady of the Lake, well, the poem we're looking at today is called The Lady of Shalott, uh, not like the onion, just going to point that out. Um, so let's just have a look at the context behind the, behind the poem um, and who wrote it and why. So Alfred Lord Tennyson, some of you may have already heard of him before. He was a British poet uh, who was born in 1809, died in 1892. He actually lived quite a long time for that time of, of history, actually. He was a poet laureate uh, during much of Queen Victoria's reign, which means he was, he was essentially employed by the royal family to write poems. Um, and he was one of the most popular British poets. And like I said, in a couple of years' time, you'll be studying some of his poetry for the GCSE. The Lady of Shalott is a narrative poem. It's also a form of, of ballad. So if you think of a ballad, power ballad, it's not usually about love. Um, but it's also got that kind of rhythmic sound to it. It does sound a little bit like a song. But a narrative poem, we're, we're going to go over what that actually means in a second. The poem is divided into four numbered parts equally. They're all equally long in length. And the first two parts contain four stanzas each, whilst the last two parts contain five. It is a long poem, obviously it telling us a story. So um, we will go, go through all of the parts in a second. Your actual final task is not going to be for the whole poem, though, so don't worry. It was originally written in 1832. This poem was later revised and published in its final form in 1842. He changed it due to Victorian audience, actually, because um, they were a little shocked. <clears throat> and their view of, of his his poem was slightly different and it wasn't particularly uh, uh, taken... It, was, it wasn't taken that badly, but it, it, he wanted to adapt it and change. And obviously, the fact that he's a poet laureate, he was writing for, for the royal family, essentially. Um, he, he did change it. Tennyson claimed that he had been, he had been based on an old Italian romance, Hence the ballad, though the poem also bears much similarity to the story of the maid of Astolet in Mallory's Morte d'Arte, like my French accent. Um, and in Mallory's account, Tennyson's lyric includes references to the Arthurian legend. Moreover, Charlotte seems quite close to Mallory's Astolet. Um, up for you for your own interpretations. <clears throat> As we go through it, you'll see and notice things that we've come across within the book so far. So, a narrative poem, it's a form of poetry that tells a story, often making the voices of a narrator and characters as well, and the entire story is usually written in verse, 
um, we will get on to a second what I mean by verse as opposed to just normal prose writing. Um, let's have a look at the poem. Um, we're going to read through it and as we do it we're going to ask ourselves these questions. There's very few actual um, parts to write down in terms of this lesson apart from right at the end. You had a really um, taxing week last week and really worked you hard. Um, but however that doesn't mean that you're not going to actually follow along and pay attention to this video because obviously there are questions we can just discuss and think about uh, amongst ourselves in our own heads. So let's read this first part and with that question you're going to say what is the first impression of the Lady of Shalott? And um, we're going to find out exactly where she is, what, what she's doing and why is she doing it. No time hath she to sport and play, a charmed web she weaves away, a curse is on her if she stay a weaving either night or day, to look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, and therefore she weaves steadily, and therefore no other care hath she, the Lady of Shalott. She lives with little joy or fear, and over the water running near, the sheep bell tinkles in her ear, and before she hangs, before her hangs a mirror clear, reflecting towered Camelot. And as the mazy web she whirls, she sees the surly village churls, and the red cloaks of market girls, pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, an abbot on an ambling pad, and sometimes a curly shepherd lad, or a long-haired page in crimson clad, goes by towered Camelot, and sometimes through the mirror blue, the knights come riding two and two. She hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. Okay, so let's just have a look at this section for a second. So she is clearly a lady, we know that much, um, she has a curse on her, and the curses means that she cannot leave her tower. She's in a tower, we're going to look at the description of the tower in a second. Um, and unfortunately, she has no joy or fear, Okay, so it's quite a normal, mundane existence. Um, however, she doesn't get to go outside, she can't go outside because of this curse, and she has to look through a mirror in order to be able to see things that are going on outside. She can't even look through a window. And in this poem here, this stanza, she's, it's been described as she's what she's seeing. So she can see um, <coughs> the Tower of Camelot. She can see um, the village people. She can see the red cloaks of the market girls. She can see people passing to and fro on the road on the way to Camelot from Shalott. She can see knights that come riding. Um, however, it says right at the end that she has no loyal knight and true, so no true love. For the Lady of Shalott. Well, what does she do with her time while she's up in that in that area? Well, she weaves every day steadily, um, therefore she weaveth. Um, and that is basically her life, her life at the moment. And we're going to go on to the next section before we go over these questions. But just think about your first impression of her already uh, and see if you're coming up with any any extra information. Okay, so on either side the river lie long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the world and meet the sky, and through the field the road runs by to many towered Camelot. The yellow leaved water lily, the green sheaved daffodilly, tremble in the water chilly round about Shalott. Willows whiten, aspens shiver, the sunbeam showers break and quiver, and in the stream that runneth ever by the island in the river, flowing down to Camelot. Four grey walls and four grey towers overlook a space of flowers, and the silent isle embowers the Lady of Shalott. And underneath the bearded barley, the reaper reaping late and early, hears her ever chanting cheerly, like an angel singing clearly. Over the stream of Camelot, and piling the sheaves in fur furrows airy, beneath the moon, the reaper weary, listen weepers, whispers, tis the fairy, the Lady of Shalott. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, again, we've got some more description of the outside world. So instead of looking at people, we're now focusing on nature around outside. Uh, wold is um, another name for kind of rolling hills and forests. Well, so you can see the rolling hills which meet the sky. And there's fields and there's water lilies and there's beautiful daffodils. I love this little bit here, actually. The yellow leaved water lily, the green sheaved daffodilly. Tremble in the water chilly. I love that part. Um, and there's willows, which are a type of trees, and aspens, which are a type of trees. The sunbeam showers break and quiver in the stream 
just is beautiful. So we've got this amazing description of this countryside outside that she just can't access, she can't get to. And then it's sort of compounded by the fact we hear where she lives herself. Four grey walls and four grey towers overlook a space of flowers. So actually, if you can imagine that she can see all of these beautiful things, albeit not through the window, it's literally within touching reach of, of her hands. If she can't get out there and she's stuck, if you look at the juxtaposition of the grey walls and the four grey towers and how dreary it seems by comparison of these beautiful um, words of the flowers, the description of the flowers. Um, in Bowers, is essentially it's, it's like a, a beautiful, green, peaceful shelter. Um, so it's sort of sheltering her, but it's sheltering her from what? I mean, it's a bit of a sad thing because she is locked up, or not locked up particularly, but she's left in this tower with this curse. And again, we've got these beautiful, um, this beautiful imagery. Um, here's her ever chanting cheerily. <clears throat> so again, she's she's still quite chipper. She's still quite smiley. It's like an angel singing clearly over the stream. Um, and again, people that listen say that it's the fairy of the Lady of Shalott. So we're getting this really kind of um, mystical and magical um, tone actually of of this whole poem. Okay. So, no time hath she to sport and play. Um, this is the first section we're going to be looking at because uh, I really want you to think about how Alfred Tennyson created a sense of loneliness for Lady Shalott. There's lots of crucial words in here that make us feel um, that she is lonely. Um, but it's not, it's not as if she's um, being abused particularly. She's not being hurt. It does say here she lives with little joy or fear. There isn't anything, but that does give us the impression it's rather just mundane. It's very, it's very safe, um, and it, she's really interesting. That you know, she's weaving, she's making this art, but she's she's not allowed to access what's going on outside there for her to get more inspiration. She's just weaving and weaving and weaving. She's making something um, for a reason, but she actually can't go and access and get this inspiration, this beautiful inspiration that's outside. Um, uh, sometimes a troop of damsels glad, we're talking about you know, the people outside here, um, to weave the ma mirror's magic sights for often through the silent nights. And this is what I mean. She delights in the fact that she's weaving, she, she's enjoying it, but she can't access and make the most of the magic uh, sights outside. You know, obviously, it's through the mirror. She's not allowed to look through anything else other than this mirror. But she knows and she understands that it's magic outside. It's beautiful. Um, and she would like to go out. And here we have a funeral with plumes and lights and music came from Camelot. And now we're not only seeing the people, we're not only describing the nature, she can hear music. Um, and she's just literally having life pass her by on this road outside. Um, she can see plumes and lights and music, you can hear music. And when the moon was overhead came two <clears throat> young lovers lately wed. Okay, so if you can really, really imagine um, she uh, she's stuck in these grey walls, grey tower. She can't look and access. She can't get out. She can't leave. She's cursed. Uh, she has to look through this mirror to be able to see what she can see outside. And what can she see? Well, beauty, nature, people laughing, beautiful water, beautiful flowers. She can hear music, and it is just this really sad. Um, just sad existence, really. I mean, she's she's happily weaving. She's not in pain. She's not in fear. She's not necessarily fearing anyone in particular. But she doesn't actually have any company, as far as I can see so far. Um, but she isn't allowed to go out to access the magic that's outside of the rolling hills and the flowers and the trees. Um, and she's really, really sad. And also that is that question, actually. Um, you know, how does Tennyson actually just you know show that she is this? Uh, lonely and, and sad character um, and here at the very end um, of sorry just go back for one second it says came two young lovers lately wed well what does that say to her there's love outside there's love there's people getting married and they are happy and having fun so not only have we got the nature and the beauty and the music and seeing people pass which we now know that you know that love can exist and there are other people out there enjoying their life together and she says at the end of the stanza i am half sick of the shadows said the lady of shalott interesting if you have a look at all of these um these stanzas we've got the repetition of the same line the lady of shalott 
passed onward from Shalott, the Lady of Shalott, the Lady of Shalott. Have a look here, Lady. Um, that's the same one. Let's have a look. Uh, run around Shalott, the Lady of Shalott, the Lady of Shalott. And that is actually called a refrain. So the lines are repeated in the poem at some distance. Okay, it can't just necessarily be <clears throat> the same next two lines consecutively because that would be repetition. But the refrain is where that line or that word is repeated at the end. Okay, and that is essentially what gives this that sort of magical musical feel, actually. Um, and it, it also makes sure as a reader um, that we are constantly brought back to her. Okay, so for every stanza we're, being, uh, we're listening to nature and we're thinking about nature and seeing how beautiful it is, but the, um, the poet is always constantly bringing us back to her, bringing us back to her, bringing us back to Shalott, bringing us back to her all the time. For us as an audience to not forget, it is about her. It's not about those lovers. It's not about the lily pads. It is about her in her solitude. Okay, let's go on to the next one. And here we're getting the first mention of Sir Lancelot. Um, so let's read it. A bow shot from her bower eaves, he rode between the barley sheaves. The sun came dazzling through the leaves and flamed upon the brazen breeze of bold Sir Lancelot. A red cross knight forever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field besides remote Shalott. The gemmy bridle glittered free, like to set some branch of stars we see, and hung in the golden galaxy, the bridle bells rang merrily. And as he rode down from Camelot, and from his blazon baldric slung, a mighty silver bugle hung, and as he rode his armour rung, beside remote Shalott. All in the blue unclouded weather, thick jeweled shone the saddle leather, the helmet and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together. And as he rode down the Camelot, sorry, from Camelot, and as often through the purple night, below the starry clusters bright, some bearded meteor trailing light moved over green Shalott. His broad, clear brow and sunlight glowed on burnished hooves his war horse trode. From underneath his helmet flowed, his coal black curls as he on he rode. And as he rode down from Camelot, from the bank and from the river, he flashed into the crystal mirror. Tira lira, tira lira, sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room, she saw the water flower bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume, and she looked down to Camelot, and out flew the web and floated wide. The mirror cracked from side to side, the curses come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. Well, this is for me the most exciting part of it. So if you can imagine the very first part. We've been introduced to her, we've been introduced to what's going around her, to her existence, to her surroundings, to the settings, but now we clearly see that we've been introduced to another character. There's the first other character that obviously she may well have actually uh, come across. Um, and she can see him, a, the choice of the word bowl, for instance. Um, and we go through here, go down, 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 let's just find it for a second. We can see that he's um, wearing beautiful... Uh, like a mighty silver bugle, uh, which is a type of horn or trumpet. Um, you know, the whole word choices that Tennyson has, has chosen to use. We've got a uh, branch of stars, golden galaxy, bridal bells. It's all very shiny, isn't it? Very, very interested. Again, thick jewel shone the saddle leather, the helmet and the helmet feather. Uh, we talk about one burning flame together. Purple, which again, obviously in this time as well, purple would have been uh, one of those really opulent colours. It wouldn't have been something that the peasant would normally have worn. So we've got bright, jewel-like, silver-like, fire-like and purple. So you can imagine, um, from her perspective, she's used to grey, grey, grey. Now we've got this complete opposite and this person. And she can has to see him through the mirror. It's very interesting. He flashed into the crystal mirror. Which is very interesting. Not only that, it's his singing. Okay, so he's described as in coal black curl as he rose. You can imagine this really brave, um, strikingly handsome, um, bold knight who's, who's coming through into her mirror as you can see. And what does she go and do? And I'm going to read this again because I love this part. <clears throat> well, she did not have any time 
uh, between seeing him and making the decision because she left the web, she left the loom, she made a few paces through the room, she saw the water flower bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume, she looked down to Camelot and out through the web, floated by the mirror cracked from side to side. So she left, okay, so she has been, she's essentially used him as her inspiration to leave, hasn't she? But I, I do feel that like she's probably feeling very trapped beforehand, but this was the, um, the the tip of the iceberg, essentially the kind of the re main reason because she saw him and she just went. But she knows, sadly, the mirror cracked from side to side due to the curse, and the curse she knows is upon her. And we have an example here of where the poet has chosen to use five lines, all with the word she. It's the same word repeated. It's called anaphora. We have covered that before um, in some of our classes. It is a repetition of the word expression in the first part of the verse. Um, what do we think that creates? I've read it very deliberately. Um, just have a ponder and have a think about what kind of effect does that create in your head. She, 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 she. Just have a think about it because that is going to be linked into your final question. Okay, so... Here we go. Um, we're going to think about pathetic fallacy. The definition of here, we have done this to death, guys. It is a personification. It's a form of personification, which is basically giving human emotions and characteristics and conduct to things found in nature that are not human. We've seen it so many times in weather, but it can be other things as well, such as leaves, rocks. Um, anything that comes from nature, you sort of give it the, the attributions of, of humans. Um, so let's have a read through this section here and see how we can find it in this poem. In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning, the broad stream in his banks complaining, heavily the low sky raining. Over towered Camelot, and outside the isle in a shallow boat, beneath the willow lay afloat. Below the carven stern she wrote, the Lady of Shalott. A cloud white crown of pearl she dight, all remented in snowy white, that loosely flew her zone in sight, clasped with one blinding diamond bright. Her eyes oh, sorry, her wide eyes fixed on Camelot, though the squally east wind keenly blew, with folded arms serenely by the water stood the queenly lady of Shalott. And with a steady stony glance, like some bold seer in a trance, beholding all of his own mischance, Mute, with a glassy countenance, she looked down to Camelot, and it was the closing of the day, and she loosed the chain, and down she lay, and the broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. As when to sailors way they roam, while they roam, by creeks and outfalls far from home, and rising and dropping with the foam, from dying swans while warblings come, flying sh shoreward so to Camelot, still as she boat head wound along, the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her chanting her death song, the Lady of Shalott. But before we go on to this next section, she has um, headed out, and unfortunately we can see now that pathetic fallacy of something is amiss, something is going to happen, uh, stormy, east wind straining, um, the pale yellow woods were waning, the broad stream complaining, and the low sky raining because it actually does give us that clue that something is now very very wrong if you can imagine the beginning of this poem where things were described as beautiful we've had this shift haven't we complete shift and change in the mood um because what she's done she's found herself a boat um and um she's actually carved her name carved and stand she wrote the lady of shalot she's put her own name onto the boat which i think is a really lovely um idea However, as the time she goes on, and there are some really kind of very sad descriptions of going what is the kind of overall feel of the poem at the second, she begins to feel unwell. And how do we know that? Well, you can see lots of clues, actually. It was the closing of the day. Well, does it necessarily mean it's night time, or does it mean the closing of her day? Uh, she loosed the chain, and down she lay. So she's literally got into the boat, and she's laid down. Essentially, the the, um, the curse is essentially just making her very weak, and unfortunately, she's dying because she knew she knew that leaving those grey walls and those grey towers, it wouldn't it come to a, a happy ending. Unfortunately, and here, right at the end, it said the willowy hills and fields among they heard her chanting her death song, the Lady of Shalott. 
So she's left. She's gone to find this beautifully shiny and, and enigmatic, amazing night that she's just seen. She wants to access the beautiful um, surroundings outside and see the people and see the nature. However, um, a long drawn carol, mournful, holy, she chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her eyes were darkened, holy, and her smooth face sharpened slowly, turned to towered Camelot. For here she reached upon the tide, the first house by the waterside, singing in her song, she died, the Lady of Shalott. And under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, a pale, pale corpse she floated by, death cold between the houses high, dead into towered Camelot, knight and burhead, lord and dame, to the planked wharf, wharfage came, below the stern they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. They'd crossed themselves, their stars they blessed, knight, minstrel, abbot, squire and guest, they lay a parchment on her breast that puzzled more than all the rest. They welved wits at Camelot, and the web was woven curiously. The charm is broken utterly. Draw near and fear not. This is I, the Lady of Shalott. Wow. So let's have a look here. We've got that whole semantic field of, of, of death, of parting, of mourning. Carol, obviously, to do with church mournful holy to do with church again so it's very kind of a christian um uh, christian feel to this really religious uh, semantic field it's chanted again that's linked to religion chanted lowly till her eyes were dark and holy and her face was going to begin to smooth over um and during her song she died um pale pale corpse got the repetition of the word pale there which really really gives us the emphasis that she was exceedingly pale by this point um, and she she basically had a boat landed near the first house as it came along the river and they don't know who she is she's not there you know no one has seen her before and they were puzzled um, and they saw they lay a parchment on her breast that puzzled more than all the rest and they couldn't quite understand what had happened um, to her the web was woven curiously and the charm is broken utterly. She's really very, very sad. So she, um, uh, you know, she made that decision essentially to to escape her boundaries, her grey walls. Uh, she knew that she had a curse. We knew that from the very first stanza. But she decided that, you know what, enough is enough. I need to, to access the magic and um. I mean, you know, she, you can tell that she's sad and lonely. Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Told you I was not feeling very well. Um, and actually, there's a whole um, kind of train of thought that actually it's not just about the Lady of Shalott who's in a tower. It represents how Victorians felt about women of the time. Um, essentially, you know, we could argue that the grey walls and the grey building that this poor woman was trapped in is basically society... Uh, and their expectations of how women should behave, they should stay in their, their lane, they should stay in their zone, they shouldn't go and access things and live as she wanted to live. Um, and like I said, it is that kind of analogy. Um, I remember Tennyson wrote this within the Victorian era and the kind of the late 1800s. Um, um, I'm thinking to me, it's Tennyson. He's, 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 a, he's a critique of, of, of how... Victorian society viewed women and treated them, you know, the box-like, um, clearly uh, defined rules that these poor women had to go through. And even in some other countries, even to this day, essentially, um, she can see life going on outside of the window, outside of the mirror, but she's not allowed to get into it. And if she does, she's going to die. But it is an argument, actually, are you better off um, going to live your life the best way that you can, and knowing that, actually, you're not going to be long for this world, um, and maybe it's not always for the right thing for everyone else, but ultimately she died happy. She she had managed to escape. She'd seen this night. Um, she got out into the nature, um, into the natural surroundings, and accessed those and smelt and seen and heard all these sights. Um, and it is very tragic that she died at the, at the end. Um, which brings us on to our final task. So hopefully what you're going to do is going to go through this extract and highlight and annotate just the same way as we would normally in class. This extract is on uh, Go for Schools. <clears throat> it is also up on Teams for you. And this is all we're looking at. This is just one extract of the poem. So let's read it through again just one last time. 
Uh, there she weaves by night and day a magic web with colours gay. She heard a whisper say, Kurt is on her if she stay. She To look down to Camelot, she knows not what the curse may be, and so she weaveth steadily, and little other care hath she for the Lady of Shalott. And moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year, shadows of the world appear, and then she sees the highway near, winding down to Camelot. And there the river eddy whirls, and there the surly village churls, and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from Shalott. That is the only section that you're going to have to work on with this guy. So the poem is very, very long. We could talk about it in your interpretations all day, and I would absolutely love for us perhaps to get together on you know on a Teams chat and discuss this poem because there's so much more of this poem that I've even covered in today's lesson, and we're already at 30 minutes already. Um, so your question is, why to response to the following question? Um, what is your first impression of the Lady of Shalott and how does the poet use colour to create this impression of her? We've discussed colour quite a bit, we'll just move this over, um, throughout the poem um, in terms of even just uh, lots a lot and how he's being perceived through this mirror, this being sparkly um, dark haired, uh, purple wearing, amazing sight. But in terms of her and her um, solitude and her loneliness and her existence, there's lots and lots of beautiful imagery within that section. In fact, the whole poem. So your question is this What am I going to suggest you to do? Well, highlight <coughs> key parts of this question, key words that you'd like to focus on. And you need to think about how writer uses language, are you words? the hidden meanings in the language, it may well mean that you have to go away and Google one or two of those words. I don't want to have a spoon feed you. It's, like I said, it's quite a simple lesson today. So how can you explain the effect the words have on you as a reader? Remember, this is your interpretation. You are entitled to your opinion, providing you can argue it with evidence taken from the extract. And there is an extension task, and I, there are one or two people that I will be expecting this from, please. I would like you to talk about techniques as well as the words. So this section here is just words, and it will be a simple case of one paragraph. Um, I may well email those of you that I'm expecting this extension task from, um, because I would like you to discuss the techniques. And I have explained to you, for instance, that anaphora. Uh, so I.E. Tennyson has used anaphora to emphasise the point that her eyes are darting from object to object, and it changes the pace of the poem. She, 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 she. she. I've also explained. Um, the kind of the idea of the refrain and how it, every kind of every verse stanza finishes off with the word Charlotte or Lady of Charlotte and why that is because it keeps us centered, it keeps us drawn back to the, the main point of the poem. There are other devices in there. We can talk about repetition, we can talk about alliteration, we can talk about oh goodness gracious, you know the, the full magnitude of things you can discuss with analysis of any literature uh, text. Um, that should be device clearly. Told you. Need to probably go to bed definitely. Um, but I would like um, a lot of you to push yourself to the extension task, please, and don't just talk about words and imagery. Actually, look at that structure because remember, when it comes to answering exam questions, we're not just looking at word choices. We need to talk about structure and form. So structure is the kind of those things that I've just mentioned, and that is the way to kind of be to grade higher is to mention structure and form. There is this amazing. Um, um, printout that I've also put on to go to schools for you, which is going to help you step one, step two, step three, step four. It's very similar to the one that you should all have in your exercise books. And do you remember we had I've had printed off the plain white um, sheet and it was used to go step by step of how to put together um, an answer. But this will obviously just help you if you haven't got your exercise book or perhaps you've lost it or it's become unstuck. And it's also just a new version. So it literally tells you step by step how you're going to do it. You read the poem, you consider the vocabulary, you read the poem out loud, and then you start thinking about the actual questions. On the left hand side, I have started um, putting together um, some sentence, sentences for you, some scaffolding, so we could start using. Um, the poet has described through, Tennyson has shown the loneliness, honestly. <laughs> I think I've had enough today. You can tell it's Friday. Tennyson has shown the loneliness and solitude through. That's where you give me the example. The solitude of the lady is emphasised by, again, pinpoint a word, perhaps, or a device. Um, this, such and such, evokes within the reader something. 
it makes the reader understand how lonely she is or how long you know how much she's longing for the real world and feel tell me how you're feeling when you read this poem um, that extract in particular the poet goes further on to use this is where we have to ascertain uh, the actual um, word choices we don't just say the word we try to kind of make sure that we're using the subject terminology correctly you can use those like I said um, you should all have those white sheets in your exercise book and if not you've been with me for a year now so you should just know how to just put a simple what how why paragraph what is the writer trying to do show solitude how have they done it well they've talked about the fact that she is living in four grey walls why because the idea the connotations of grey gives me uh, the reader and the impression of and this is in juxtaposition to the beauty outside, for instance. And you're just going to do one paragraph of that. Um, and then a second one if you are doing the extension task, which I would expect a lot of you to be doing. Because it's a nice, simple lesson. Take time. Get your colored highlighters out. Get your Word document. Um, if you haven't got an actual printer, don't worry. You can still do it on a Word document. So download it and go to the schools. And um, you can still annotate it and highlight it on a Word document. I am definitely going to go. Um, possibly going to take some paracetamol. I hope everyone feels okay and you're not feeling similar to me and I will be back next week. Um, any questions though please don't hesitate to email or ask. Thank you very much.